University at the University of Surrey. Um, and I'm currently being sponsored by Tesco Labs to do work on deep learning for robotic grasping in particular the traditional warehouse um, okay. So in our sort of picking task, uh, we have a customer type um, come along and then like the link here, and then our products come to the same place um, from a central system with a whole lot of set of products um, in there, all of the same type, but in all sorts of different positions, orientations, and things like that. So this is a very specific problem of uh, compared to sort of just general grasping, uh, but it still provides a lot of complexity that we've definitely not solved yet. So in order to try and get sort of human level um, performance on this pick and place issue, we split it up into the sort of way that humans um, do it. So first we have to localize the object, move towards the object, uh, do the act of grasp synthesis of creating a uh, stable grasp around it. Then we need to manipulate the object in some way, and then finally place it down without damaging the object or the environment. So we focus on localizing the object and then the act of graph synthesis um, using the perception with, um, for localizing the object and then the control side for the graph synthesis. We then also plan to use the perception for the localizing the object to be able to help us then place it once we have manipulated it. Um, so just a bit of an overview of robotic grasping. Um, there tends to have been two different sides of it, so the engineered methods with geometric and dynamic grass criteria. Um, this tends to be quite difficult in the sense that you need um, object, environment, robot walls, and tends to be very prone to sense noise, so not really practical for adapting to new situations. On the other side, uh, data driven methods use the existing of grasps to either map to from known grasps to similar objects or um, use it as training data for machine learning. So recently, deep learning, everybody knows it's the hot topic, so it's been applied more reasonable um, side of the So this is what we do first on. So just, I'm sure what deep learning is, but I'm just gonna sort of recap it just in case. So it uh, works on tasks which can be represented like this with an agent that uh, performs actual environment, and then feeds back a reward signal and observation. And then the agent can decide which action it can take based on that observation. So in our particular case, we would be using the Baxter robot from uh, Reaping, and our environment will be a distribution center. <coughs> so we formalize this um, after the decision process, so we set states, a set of actions, um, a reward function telling us how um, good it was moving from our previous state to our current state. Um, and a transition probability distribution going, telling us the likelihood of any other one state from our current state given a particular action, and a discount factor uh, implying how important future rewards are compared to uh, current rewards. So we started experimenting with just a mock problem, which like this, which had a three-jointed arm trying to get the endpoint to a goal, so our states would be the position of the endpoint to the goal, the actions would be moving the angles, um, our reward would be something related possibly to distance, uh, from the goal, and for this particular case, it's a uh, deterministic, so we don't really care about the probability distribution. Um, and our discount factor, I think we used as 0.9 or something, because it then it, it means that the future rewards are still very important, but our current rewards are the most important. So, as I said, the aim is to maximize a reward. Over time, we do this using our policy, which maps from us the state space to the action space, um, and we do this using the value function. Um, which gives us the expected future reward um, using a given policy. So there's loads and loads of different reinforcement learning algorithms out there. Many of which we've heard of, especially if you've been in the news with things like um, the AlphaGo network. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the ones that we've used or come across. So Q learning is a very popular one, uh, which um, tries to maximize the action value function, which gives us the discounted sum rewards. Um, maximum discount sum rewards over time uh, across all possible policies. So if we have this optimal value from actual value function, we can have optimal policy by selecting the high skew value for a given um, state and action. Um, this uh, has been implemented recently with uh, deep learning, so with the deep learning networks uh, for pretty good success, uh, but has troubles when scaled up, I think, to and to continuous systems, it doesn't work so well. Then there's 
on the other side, so it's sort of value-based, policy-based networks, so using things like policy gradient methods, which instead of using the value function uh, for a lot of us, we look at the, uh, we do directly uh, estimate the policy and then use the gradient of the reward to our data. And then as a combination of these two, we get active protein methods, which both use estimates of the value function and the policy in order to um, run the system. And then, um, so one of the very popular ones are these, the asynchronous advantage active critic methods, uh, which both uh, which uses um, a neural network which has shared weights, uh, one which predicts the, um, the action, so it's our policy, and one which is, predicts the value. Um, and then uses the advantage function, which tells us how much better or worse uh, we performed than expected in our data. So there's loads and loads of different challenges in reinforcement learning, uh, for example, which particular the, uh, actual method you use. Uh, but there's also, especially within robotics, a whole extra set of challenges. Even though it's been used in robotics for a really long time, these are still continuous research questions. So do we use model-based or a model-free approach? There's been lots of evidence to show model-based approaches are great, but only for limited uh, dimensionality, which in robotics is obviously a big problem. Um, we also need to consider the action space. So a lot of the algorithms work really, really well with the three action spaces, but as soon as we move to continuous action spaces, which is more ideal for robotics, because we want to be able to have actions which aren't mutually exclusive. We want to be able to move up and left at the same time, for example. Um, we also have the problem of volume of data. As we're moving towards deep reinforcement learning, we need so much more data. Um, however, as you all know, robotics is slow when it comes to data if you play. Um, acquiring data. So we try to challenge this uh, to change this in two, two ways. One was by using prior knowledge in our system, so you have all the heuristics, but then this limits our solution and could end up with an, a not more solution. So this sort of I think should be used in sort of small amounts. Uh, on the other side, there was simulation, which has become huge in the last sort of couple of years, where the simulator is getting better and better. So we sort of focus on trying to change the simulation to start with and then use some form of transfer there. So with all these challenges in mind, um, we aim to use exceptions, so starting with just taking in images, not taking in um, data, uh, data such as the states of where the role is or where the arm is, because we don't really have access to that information in, um, accurately. So we will use um, visuals for RGB images to select the next action. So we start with this really simple problem, so this is just it, doing random walk and pain visibly, um, and we use a deep reinforcement learning system to um, predict an action and um, feed that back um, into the environment so that we can then get an observation continuously. So we use the A to B method that I mentioned earlier. Our input is an um, image of the current configuration and the reward is mod positive for achieving the goal and very small negative ones for not. Um, and we achieve just for a fixed goal an uh, average of 15 actions per episode, which in comparison to 200 or something it took when it was doing random walk uh, is significantly better. However, when we started placing the goal randomly at the beginning of each episode, we found it didn't converge well at all. So we used great learning, which is inspired by how we learn as children, so starting with a simple problem and gradually making it more and more complex. So for this problem, we started by placing the um, goal in one segment of the, of the play space and then gradually increasing the area available to it. Uh, it, it we showed that it actually massively increased performance, allowing us to get right to the same level of accuracy with a fixed goal, but with goals being placed wherever it wants in the um, area. So obviously this is fine, but it doesn't directly apply to this, so we decided to move back on to a more sort of realistic simulator, going with the Vigo simulator contractor. So this is its own set of challenges. Um, you can't just spin up hundreds of um, mass simulators on one machine. It's quite computationally expensive and just, it just doesn't perform well. So we sort of created a system with using Ross Multimaster and um, Ross Action Servers to allow our Zebra simulators to communicate with central deep learning machines. So we only did one deep learning capable machine and then had many sort of workstation style machines um, running our simulators. So this allowed us to scale up our Baxter based simulations, uh, and we um, we use a deep recurrent network, uh, taking in again images, so it's all visual still, taking in an image from our um, worker and outputting um, an action which gets sent back to the um, worker. 
Um, so we found that the just even just the two workers, it's just the grass, because if you try and put hundreds of workers on the grass, it doesn't it there. So with even just the two workers, we found that the length of the um, the number of actions needed per um, episode massively increased down to just ten. Um, and then that was a fixed goal, so with a uh, like a goal that can be set anywhere at the beginning of each episode. We found that um, it's still using the curriculum learning. We managed to keep the number of episodes still, or sorry, the uh, number of actions per episode still below 10. Um, and then this is just sort of some images showing the random policy versus trade policy that they are going to be directed at rather than flying around below 10. So this approach is great, but it's still really slow. Like on the graph, it shows these, it still takes thousands and thousands of iterations for it to converge. So it's not really practical if we then want to move more towards real robotics and more challenging problems. So um, we started looking at some work um, from IROS in 2017, um, who, and they managed to, they presented a method um, that trained a simple robotic arm um, for degrees of freedom to move from a static position to a target in um, just six episodes, so just six real uh, life examples, and it was able to do it perfectly. So this uses Gaussian processes to learn a, the transition um, model, and also the reward function. And then it uses our neural network for a Gaussian process to learn policy, and it works very well, mainly because of the Gaussian process's ability to model uh, complex systems with small amounts of data. But it only works on, it, it, this uh, system is only shown working with a static start point and a static goal point, which is not really up to what we need it to. So what we want to do is um, use the sort of what we've been doing with visual um, perception and integrate it with this sort of based approach in order to, um, uh, to enable it to complete more complex tasks, um, uh, but with this sort of uh, level of training time. So to try and reduce it down from a thousand episodes to uh, by a few uh, a few degrees. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.